15. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction and indeed for inviting me to this event, which is a real pleasure uh, to be part of. Um, now, one of the things that fascinated me when I began to start writing this book, uh, Under the Hornbeams, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, was the question of at what point uh, one's experience becomes a story. Because in a way, I tend to think of everyday life as one giant story that we're all participating in, like a sort of huge, ever-expanding collage with little interlinking stories which might connect or disconnect or enhance or even uh, over, overlay each other, um, but in interesting ways, forming part of this larger fabric. So in the which case, where would any particular story uh, begin and end? But obviously, since a book has to sit between two covers and this talk possibly has to sit within its 15 minute slot, um, then we need to have a beginning and we need to have an end, however much that end may slice into the flow of experience in somewhat artificial ways. So the story I want to tell begins, uh, as we've mentioned, in Regent's Park, and I'm going to share some images with you here and whisk you into the park uh, in April 2020. Now, 2020 was, uh, as, as Rosie mentioned, uh, a time of lockdown. Um, the world has sort of stood still. The, um, the cars and aeroplanes have gone silent uh, momentarily. And the birds seem to be singing louder than ever before. But just as the kind of beauty of the spring seems to be magnified by this sort of slowing down and this quietness, there is also something else which is magnified, which is the kind of anxiety and fear on people's faces. Uh, there is fear in the air and the air itself has become a thing to fear. What might it be carrying? Uh, what happens if you are uh, stand too close to someone jogging past you in the park? Uh, don't breathe too much. Uh, don't inhale. And, and soon, in fact, we will be wearing masks. So as I was wandering around the park, observing this kind of fear, two faces of two men uh, stood out to me very particularly, precisely because they did not exude fear, but actually a kind of calm and magnanimity and curiosity about the world, uh, which was very different from this type of anxiety. And these were the faces of two men, Nick and Pascal, who were living under the trees. Um, and they were living, and they've been living there for five years. No tent, no access to fire, no access to light, no money, no security. So none of the props, the basic props, really, that most of us would consider the absolute essentials of everyday existence. And yet they were attracting birds, squirrels, field mice, dogs, foxes, and some people who recognised this kind of calm. I'm not homeless. This is my home, Nick tells me shortly into our acquaintance. And he often refers to his life uh, in Regent's Park, living in the open, as a privilege. An arrangement without an arrangement is how Pascal refers to their improvisational way of living alongside each other, something they've actually been doing for 20 years now. Nick is now in his late 60s, Pascal in his late 40s. When I ask Nick how they're managing for food, his response is quite arresting. We manage, he says. People are kind. They bring things. They get something out of it because they feel good about giving. And it's good for us because we get to eat the food. So there's a kind of dignity and wisdom and humour in that response. It's not about um, worthy benefactors or, or needy victims, but really about relationships of exchange and mutuality. And I sort of immediately sense that we're likely to get along, and we do. So to meet these men living and thinking in the open at a time when so many of us are closed in, kind of locked within our houses, attached to our computers, our work life and social life reduced to the digital, was an incredible breath of fresh air. 
it was a chance to reconnect to the physicality of life and also to reconsider certain core values, to reassess what matters. What is freedom? What is a home? What is contentment? What happens when we strip away the layers of comfort that we have become so dependent upon? And in what ways are we connected to nature, albeit nature in the city, and to the larger scheme of things? And getting to know uh, Nick and Pascal and seeing them on a daily basis and spending time with them also alerted me to the uh, sort of undetected networks of, of support that were coming in and out of the park that in some ways enabled them to live the life that they were leading. There's Jim, who's a sweeper who works down by the Regent's Canal. And every morning at five o'clock in the morning, Jim would fill up two flasks of hot water and hide them just near to the warthog enclosure of the zoo so that Nick and Pascal have access to hot water during the day. But equally, there's Sandy, an ex-film uh, producer who might turn up with banana cake one week or a book by Aldous Huxley or Walter Benjamin or Isaac Babel the next. Books all gratefully received and avidly read and reflected upon. There is also Bachi seen here with his dog, Lizzie, a rescue dog who's blind. They come every evening, I soon learn, and have been doing so for some years. It's a place to relax and spend time together. And once a week, Batchy will do an online shop to make sure that certain basic things are there for Nick and Pascal. And then there is me who enters the equation, uh, a university professor struggling with her professional life during the day at a time when things were particularly fractious and political and bureaucratic uh, requirements were, were quite oppressive, uh, finding pleasure in the simple act of cooking uh, home food that I could take to the park, sharing the fruits of my labor with Nick and Pascal, and to sit outside in the open and find that kind of peace that Jackie was talking about earlier under the trees um, and talk uh, openly about anything with people with very open minds. And sometimes it was quite literally the fruits of the park that we were turning around, so to speak, um, so we'd watched um, the crab apples ripen from their tiny little green nuggets to becoming very beautiful sort of golden baubles that you see here. Um, and Nick commented, the parakeets get the ones at the top, the humans get the ones at the bottom, and the ones in the middle are left to rot in a tree, some kind of natural order of things. And when he presents me with a large bag of crab apples, I take them home, convert them into crab apple jelly, and then return them to the park, sort of enjoying the fact that they're returning to their place of origin. And one day when I'm out walking with Nick uh, in the long grass looking for mushrooms, we come across, a, uh, we meet an old man who hasn't seen Nick for a while, but recognizes his, him and, and says with sort of pleasure, you know, how are you? Uh, and Nick says, how do I look? Uh, and the man says, you look very well. And Nick's response is very interesting. He says, I've come to the conclusion that if you have nothing, you actually have everything. How so, the man asks, because it brings out the best in people, is Nick's reply. So to spend time with Nick and Pascal was a chance to step into a world in which capitalism, so incredibly pervasive in our everyday life, somehow felt parochial, if not irrelevant. And it was also to enter a world in which um, the trees, the people, uh, animals were seen to exhibit a kind of porosity and in a kind of interactive way. Pascal is rooting himself back into the ground, says Nick of Pascal's hair, which you can see here, um, which if it weren't tied into a, in, into a knot would indeed be sweeping the leaves. Is that tree dancing? I ask Nick. When we're walking along on a cold winter's day, when the leaves have, uh, when the trees have have discarded their mantle of leaves, uh, to reveal the beauty of their bare skeletons. But of course, to be outside all the time 
is also to endure the weather and everything that it flings at you in a very particular way. And it makes one realize how, how much of one's life is screened from the weather rather than actually being in it. Um, and this might mean standing under umbrellas. And in fact, I took this photo when they'd actually been standing up for 36 hours because it had been persistent rain without stopping, which meant that there was no opportunity to sit down. But the umbrellas are hung in the trees in order to prevent one's arm from getting um, weary. But of course, to be outside also means embracing those moments, such as this moment, just a, an hour of unexpected sunshine in November, a chance to read a book, or in this case, listen to a pocket radio. And being out in all weathers and at all times of day means seeing so much that we very often don't see. The beauty, for example, of this night sky with the moon so delicately caught in the fingertips of the hornbeams. It is also to experience a sort of existential pleasure of disappearance in the mist on a December morning. And of course, it is to experience the hardship of the cold and the frost of winter. All of these things alerted me then to both the beauty and the hardship of existence and taught me to take note and live in the moment and learn the skills of adaptation. It's January 2021, and as you can see, it's snowing. Nick and Pascal have been evicted from the park, or at least threatened with eviction. They have no idea where they're going to sleep tonight. I ask Pascal if he's feeling anxious. Anxiety, he says. Oh, that's a modern condition. These days, people swim in anxiety. They drown in anxiety. But it's not for me. Nick, meanwhile, is enjoying the snow. It's a chance to see the same world differently, he says. When a man walks past, asking if he can interview him about being homeless, he says, I've never thought of myself as homeless. Fancy a snowball fight? And he's off, throwing snowballs at a stranger. So, whilst I was spending time in the park each day with Nick and Pascal, I did end up keeping some sort of park diary, but it wasn't with the intention of writing a book. It was more to preserve the memory of a very special time. In my mind, I thought that if I ever converted this into a story, it would be something I did perhaps in 20 years time, looking back to the extraordinary moment of the pandemic at the time when I'd met these remarkable men and formed a close friendship with them. But as the year went on and our friendship grew stronger, Nick began to see me as a kind of archivist of their life in the park, encouraging me to document it. And with that extraordinary act of trust, uh, my experience began to transform from an experience into the story, which is the book Under the Hornbeams. And I decided to frame the book through the seasons, because if you're living outside, your life is so shaped by the seasons. So returning from April to April seemed like a a natural cutoff point, even if in many ways it's utterly unnatural because our relationship continues and extends well beyond those dates and into the present. They participated in the writing of the book in various ways, in particular by adding eight pages at the end in which they thank approximately 100 people for different things that they have done for them over the years or brought them. And these make very interesting reading because they also show the, the, the webs of sociality uh, in which they participate. So I'm just going to return, oops, for a moment, just for a last moment. So Under the Hornbeams is basically a story that I walked into. And among the many lessons it taught me was the enchantment that exists all around us is often in the everyday. And that everything in life may potentially become a story. So I suppose my question would be to you, what story do you want to tell? And has it already begun? Thank you for listening. Wow.